French Revolution looms large over history. Even outside of France, it's seen as a monumentous accomplishment, a great leap towards Western democracy, a triumph for the idea that all should have a say in government. And that makes it all the stranger that this explosion of democracy served as a crucible for dictatorship. In the end, the rule of the many led to the rule of the one, which at the time was exceptionally popular. Welcome all to No One Is Competent, the premier history podcast about how revolutions fail or change or, you, you know, in the end, they, they're just like doing their own thing, man. Like, why do you have to put a label on it? I am Azalea, and I am joined by my brilliant co-host, Jaharis Brunstead. Hello, welcome all. Uh, yeah, this is, a, uh, I think, uh, an episode we've been meaning to do for a while now. This, this is a, this is a momentous occasion, Jay. This is like, we, we've never made a part four-ish of a series before, so this is treading new ground. This is also, you know... An episode where we get to talk about the boy. Finally. A and I think we'll... It'll, it'll be very popular. I, for one, am looking forward to recording an episode that's less than two hours long. <laughs> well, can't make any promises just yet. <laughs> yeah, you know, ar around like the 80-minute mark, I might start going on like a long rant about competitive Smash Melee. So stop me if that happens. Will do. You know, Jay, I was thinking about our podcast the other day and how we release every other week. And, you know, that hamstrungs a lot of how much we can get in algorithms and our growth and whatnot. But, you know, one, we do this in the time we can do it. But also, I I'm really glad that this podcast isn't topical or that we cover stuff that's really in the news a lot because like like th this last summer has felt like just a every time i sit in front of the microphone i feel like the entire world is different <laughs> yeah like either the prime minister of japan has been gacked or the queen is dead or iran is in an uprising or this war in ukraine or like like we're sitting here right now as Brazil is about to have probably their most important election in a very long time. I, I, I can say that I'm pretty glad that we are not in the in the business of current affairs, you know. When we did our we did a re most recent episode of Brian Kemp, I was thinking like, yeah, this is like a little bit topical <laughs> for for our standards. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, an election in one single state. It's not, you know, Brazil or whatever. <laughs> and we didn't cover anything that had happened even in like the last, what, like, like just the last two months. Yeah. <laughs> in that episode, which went over better than I thought it would. You know, it's way. it's best to to leave that kind of thing to be uh, to the professionals or. The people who like to think of themselves as professionals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because that goes so well. I mean, let's just be glad that, you know, I didn't make this, you know, then turn this podcast into just the, the, the Russia-Ukraine podcast for the past almost a year now. <laughs> or, you know, we could take the easy way out and just spend our time reading uh, New York Times deranged op-eds and dunking on them uh, for hours on I end. mean... I don't know we why, do but that, that strikes eventually. me as a really popular and sustainable <laughs> source of content. We might do that eventually. That a yeah, certain I don't, I don't group of that incredibly out. popular ramblers <laughs> are very good at doing and have gotten fame and fortune. I'm back to that well. I mean, it can be pretty amusing. As an essayist and as a writer, like, mask off for a second i grew up shall we say creatively in uh the anime analysis community when i that was like my 16 to 20 
years on YouTube. That's where I kind of cut my teeth as a lot of writing before I pivoted to noveling. And there, that was a lot of weirdness and strangeness and beauty and glory and heinousness. Um, but, like, you know, it was inherently very silly because it was a bunch of nerds talking about Japanese cartoons. But, like, the writing quality and pettiness levels, I don't think were worse the, the writing quality was not worse and the pettiness levels were not higher of all of the infighting of that community than you might find on like the washington post op-ed page i mean if you've read anything by thomas friedman you know written in the past 10 years i think you could say that once you've made a name for yourself as one of those like big liberal calmness your writing quality can degrade to that of like a seventh grader and you'll still get you'll still get gigs it's just amazing what's considered professional standards these days in all of news frankly now that i'm a podcaster who edits and thinks about audio engineering and whatnot sometimes i'll be in a restaurant or whatever a bar like cnn is on and I'm listening to the mic quality that that passes, and uh, on cable television, and I'm just like, is this the best you can do? Like even on remote, like you you have millions of dollars. Come on, man. Sounds like you're recording inside of a tin box. Truly, there is no uh, there's no correspondence between uh, quality and success, which is why we aim to make this podcast as great as possible for you. Despite the fact that, you know, aside from the deep state, this podcast has no sponsors and no advertising. So please interact with it on the platform of your choosing Give us a follow, give us a like, give us a subscribe, give us a review, give us a retweet, give us a, what, you, you, you know, jiggle the algorithm around. Interact with the software for us. You can find us on Twitter at jharrys48 and at Azalea Wyatt. You can reach us there if you'd like. I'm always desperate to talk to people because I'm a very lonely person. Or you can reach out to us at nooneiscompetent at gmail.com. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce, and it's time to get into the story of Napoleon Bonaparte and the Directory of France. Though, before we do so, uh, it's worth going over some of the sources that we use for this episode. Those include The French Revolution, a very short introduction by William Doyle for Oxford University Press, Napoleon, a concise biography by David A. Bell, also for Oxford University Press, Napoleon and the Easter Insurrection in Corsica by Shannon Selen, Joseph Bonaparte by John S. C. Abbott, and like I mentioned on uh, one of our previous episodes, I've just been in the background, been listening to a lot of the Age of Napoleon podcast by Everett Rummage, so a lot of the knowledge I gained from that has kind of like just worked its way into these scripts. Um, it, it's a very good podcast. I highly recommend it. Same for me with uh, Mike Duncan's Revolution series for the French Revolution. Yes. And, you know... And I guess it's worth mentioning right now, in case people haven't figured out, that th- you can listen to this as a standalone episode as we cover Napoleon's history and some French politics in uh, the end of the 18th century. But this is sort of part four in a series explaining the French Revolution and Napoleonic period. We And if you listen to our King Louis the Sixteenth episode, our French Revolution episode, our War of the First Coalition episode, all of those events will kind of lead you here with us today. And we, we they all tell their own individual stories, but we hope together they, they create a co- Parent narrative uh, specifically on the french political side we've already outlined sort of the first four parts of the french revolution and we'll be going into part five here 
So there will not be a lot of backstory and background for how we got to this particular point. We're actually spending that backstory on a different subject we're about to be getting into. So if you don't want to be confused on the stuff that happened before 1795, get your asses over to those episodes and take a listen because we're just going to get started with the directory. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, this is a continuation of our series, um, but we're going to take a little bit of a step back uh, and to just cover the early life and career of Napoleon Bonaparte. You know, we've already covered his military exploits at Toulon and in Italy in previous episodes, but we haven't really talked about his background and rise to prominence. And since Napoleon will be the central actor in our upcoming episodes on the Napoleonic Wars, it's worth providing a bit of that biographical information now. Napoleon, I think, is one of the individuals with the greatest number of biographies written about him in all of history. Uh, We won't be doing a comprehensive biography. There are plenty of those you can find. Um, Sure. You know. You can make an entire podcast about that, Everett Rummage did. (laughs) This is one of the guys of history. Genghis Khan, (laughs) Hitler, George Washington, Churchill. This is probably one of the top five historical names known. And we'll be getting into why people know his name. I actually didn't know. I, I knew like a lot of the clinical about Napoleon, you know, the stuff to pass your AP Euro test before we started this podcast but i didn't never knew much about his personality about his worldview about what made him so exceptional one of the things we'll get into is that though the man was undoubtedly skilled there's many many timelines where he was just a very good officer in the french military oh for sure because things sort tilted the way they did and he was often in the right place at the right time and made the right decisions at the right time he (laughs) winds up controlling a significant chunk of the planet and it's amazing to think about how many people in history are the not polian bonapartes yeah the the people who also had the capacity to do this just (laughs) never got the shot yeah you know, after we talk about Napoleon, we'll shift to discussing the Directory, which is a government that ruled France from 1795 to 1799, and which was both propped up by and eventually overthrown by Napoleon Bonaparte. Probably worth discussing from a meta standpoint. Jay, could you kind of talk a little bit about the historical argument over where people like to declare the French Revolution as, quote, over? And because, you know, in, in reality, there, it's, it's, that's kind of a dumb thing to do, but it's a thing that people like to do. So could you discuss kind of the meta of how people see it? Sure. I, I think a lot of people will use 1799. That's, uh, we'll get to that, but that's when the directory is overthrown and replaced by the French consulate. And you know, the French consulate is a thoroughly undemocratic government, um, in many ways, it's mostly just a vehicle for Napoleon's rise to power. And therefore, 1799 is, is a pompier end date for the end of the revolution. Some will use 1795 and, you know, the rise of the French directory, because, again, they'll see, they see the directory as pretty unrevolutionary in many ways, uh, counter-revolutionary, arguably. Sure. Um, so... Between the two, I would, if I had to pick one, I would lean towards 1799. I think that's a little bit more popular of a date. And I think it's a little bit better because at least during the years of the directory, you know, there are some pretty uh, pretty large-scale efforts to try to move politics back in a more revolutionary direction. They'll fail, but the efforts are made. Whereas from 1799 onwards it, the more revolutionary elements of french politics are, are very clearly you know not effective yeah and another thing that makes this hairy is that this is all you know the french revolution is often equated with democracy which 
I would argue, and I think you could probably, has already been argued by our previous episodes, is a little bit of a misnomer. But if, if you're looking, saying, oh, the French Revolution was ended and then Napoleon became a you know, dictator, autocrat, whatever, whatever you want to call him, consul, fucking weeb, really... I mean, the system was always questionably democratic, but after the fall of the Girondins, like, calling any French government democratic yeah. <laughs> was really full sham town, you know? Yeah, for sure. I don't even think that I, the directory was significantly l uh, less democratic than, uh, say, Robespierre, yeah. but we'll get into that uh, later. I guess I should start uh, with the boy, our Napoleon Bonaparte backstory. I wonder how popular the name Napoleon was. Like, was that a weird name for the time? Or did you know, like, four Napoleons growing up in Corsica? I haven't read too much into it. My general understanding is that, like, it was not super popular, but it was also not, like, unheard of. It was like a... Like a a mid-tier Corsican name. Like, obviously, believing in it, non nominative determinism is, is stupid, but as a writer, a man named Napoleon Bonaparte is going to do something of significance in this world. Sure, you, that, he, he would have been glad to hear that. <laughs> solid A-tier name. It is, yeah. All right. This dude was born on August the 15th of 1769, nice, in Ajikio, Corsica. As a Corsican, his first language was not French, but rather the Corsican variant of Italian. At the time of his birth, he had one older brother, Joseph, and over the years, Joseph and Napoleon would be joined by further three brothers and three sisters who survived past infancy. The most relevant of these younger siblings is the third son, Lucien. That Napoleon was born a Corsican is a bit of trivia that is popularly known. You may have heard someone try to sound smart by saying, actually, technically, Napoleon wasn't French. But few are aware of the actual political situations on the island of Corsica prior to his birth. And... In the mid-18th century, it was a surprisingly dynamic place. For years, the people of this small Mediterranean island had been fighting a war of independence against Corsica's longtime owners, the Italian Republic of Genoa. Under the guerrilla leader, Pascal Paoli, the Corsicans drove the Genoese out of the majority of the island and established a republic in 1755. This independence would prove to be short-lived, however, as Genoa sold their claim to the island to the Kingdom of France in 68. Now, Genoa in the 1700s was a weak military power. France was not. Within a year of landing on the island, the French had seized total control and expelled Pauli, who fled with his followers to London. For this reason, Napoleon Bonaparte would be born in 1769 on French, not Corsican, or Genoese territory. So this is why he's a Frenchman. Napoleon's family, the Bonapartes, were members of the Corsican nobility of middling importance. Corsica in general was seen as a backwater place where tradition and religion dominated. The island was lacking in terms of both farmland and resources. Banditry was common in the rough interior and violence in general was prevalent. For example, settling personal disputes with stilettos or pistols was still seen as very legitimate, as the old concept of vendettas remained strong amongst both commoners and nobility alike. Now, this nobility traced their origins back to the senators of ancient Rome, largely without much evidence. Uh, but because of this, interest in the classics was as strong in Corsica as it was anywhere else in Europe at the time. Now, this meant that Napoleon, who was an avid reader from a young age, grew up reading about and idolizing such figures as Pericles, Lysander, Alexander, and Caesar. He's, he's, he's a classic nerd. <laughs> One of the things that I fundamentally believe is that 
you know, in a lot of ways, people have not changed over the years. Every type of personality that is around today was around in the past. Oh, they were sure. just channeled into different things. So, for instance, every train nerd that exists now, if they lived 300 years ago, maybe they were into aqueducts or roads or something. All right. And every degenerate weeb anime fan or person who can name uh, 40 sentient Star Wars races off the top of their head who exist today, if they lived in 1770 Corsica, would have been constantly reading about ancient Rome. Really into Plutarch. <laughs> Napoleon will actually write like... A writer, you know, when when Napoleon's like a teenager, he'll write, I can't remember his name, but it's one of the Enlightenment guys and send him like some of his essays. And this guy will write back and be like, you sound like a character from Plutarch. And that was probably a little bit of a dig being like, you sound like you're kind of like pompous and you think like you're some great individual. But that probably got his rocks off. Yeah, he 100% took that as a compliment. I mean, this is a dude who is going to declare himself consul. Yeah. <laughs> that is essentially the same if I took over the United States and I made, like, the sigil of the country, those, like, two wings from Attack on Titan. Basically the exact same in thing. In fairness, he's not alone in this regard. Like, we didn't really talk about it much, but one of the social things that happens during the French Revolution is that people stop giving, a lot of people stop giving their kids Christian names and instead start giving them Roman names. There are a lot of like Maximilians and Brutuses born in France from like 1789 onwards. Um, like this, this was very much in vogue at the day. Sure. Yeah. So Napoleon's father, Carlo, had been a close supporter of Pauli, but Carlo chose to remain on the island and work for the French rather than flee into exile with his compatriots. Napoleon himself would later see this as a personal failing of his father, but Carlo's decision would prove instrumental in shaping both Napoleon's future and his kind of contradictory nature. Because, you know, this meant that on one hand, Napoleon grew up hearing war stories from family friends who had fought with Pauli, and this imbued him with a strong sense of Corsican nationalism. On the other hand, Napoleon would come to benefit from his father's connections with the French government. The young Bonaparte cursed the French as occupiers while counting the French governor of Corsica as a close family friend. You know, this is very Shakespearean in its nature of like a sort of dual split loyalties. Yeah, very much so. Good writing. Good writing. And you can get a sense for Napoleon's nationalism and propensity for grandiose statements in the letter that he would later write to Pauli, in which he stated, quote, I was born as the fatherland was dying. 30,000 Frenchmen vomited upon our coats, drowning the seed of liberty in torrents of blood. This was the spectacle that first impressed itself upon my sight. So I guess young baby Napoleon was already very concerned about the French occupation. Despite personal feelings, both Joseph and Napoleon were sent for education in France at a young age. Joseph became a lawyer and Napoleon became a soldier. From the age of nine, Napoleon attended a military academy in Brienne, which probably totally didn't uh, mentally and sexually scar him and leave him with PTSD that would make him a cruel person for probably the rest of his life. His foreign background and Corsican accent made him a prime target for intense bullying. That's one thing you have to remember about every nobleman or who grows up in this period of history is like all these guys spend most of their formative years at all boys boarding schools where they're probably like getting hazed and they know at least four friends who have been raped and it's it's re it's really fucking toxic i've read more about like the british boarding school culture than the french but it, it's pretty wild and it kind of makes sense when you think of like a lot of the british creatures of empire spent their formative years being abused by by their upperclassmen yeah, a system, the, the 
the Europeans are going to tear the world apart and abuse the entire planet, right? And that comes from the fact that they first systematically abused each other. Yeah. Napoleon nonetheless managed to stay the course, graduating from Brienne before attending the prestigious École Militaire in Paris, gaining a commission as an artillery officer in the French army in 1785. The years between his commissioning into the army and the start of the French Revolution would prove to be not particularly remarkable for Napoleon. He was assigned to a relatively backwater posting in the Rhone Valley, but spent most of his time away from the army taking charge of his family's affairs in Corsica. Carlo Bonaparte had died in 1786, leaving the family deeply in debt due to a series of bad investments, and Napoleon thus spent much of his time keeping the Bonapartes afloat. The rest of his time was largely spent on writing, history, philosophy, and even gothic romance, a career that he might have pursued if wider events have gone differently. Jay, I have to read Napoleon's <laughs> rope. You didn't tell me Napoleon was a romance writer. I'm a romance <laughs> writer. He was not a very good romance writer. Um, not very good philosophy oh, I writer have to either. This up. He probably I have could have to been dig this up. Yeah. He probably could have been a, a, a decent historian. And, and you say, oh, he was just like 21 at the time. I, I wrote a novel when I was 21. I want to compare. Yeah. It is perhaps due to the somewhat stagnant nature of Napoleon's military career as of the late 1780s that he welcomed the start of the revolution with great enthusiasm. Finally, he would have the chance to make a name for himself as a man of destiny. And it was on his home island of Corsica that he would attempt to do so. Now, in 1790, the new National Assembly permitted Pasquale Pauli to return from exile and run for the position of president of the Department of Corsica, which Pauli won easily. Napoleon was an enthusiastic supporter of Pauli. Pauli was his childhood hero, after all. But the relationship between the two would soon fall apart. You know, it's one of the great historical examples of never meet your heroes. Um, you know, Pauli's vision for the island was one that was still rooted in Corsican tradition, you know, a society that was dominated in large part by the church and the prominent noble families. Napoleon and his brothers, on the other hand, imagined a transformed Corsica with themselves at the head. They imagined themselves as the modern incarnation of the Gracchi brothers of ancient Rome, and actively embraced the ideals of the new revolution. Pauli, in turn, viewed the young Bonapartes as presumptuous and arrogant, with Napoleon then increasingly viewing Pauli as a bitter old man. The, the two would fall apart completely when Napoleon defeated the candidate supported by Pauli in an election for the position of lieutenant colonel in the new Corsican National Guard. Now, it's worth noting at this point, Napoleon's ambitions were restricted to his home island, and he was operating not on his own, but in close concert with his family. His brother Joseph was elected to the position of deputy mayor of Ajaccio, with the mayor being a close relative of the Bonapartes, and Lucien became a leading member in the Corsican branch of the Jacobin Club. You know, the, the Bonapartes na right now are like, they're basically just planning to take over Corsica. Like, that's their ambition. Napoleon's not thinking he's becoming the emperor of the French. He wants to just be in charge of his little island uh, with, with his brothers. Yeah, and right now we're in phase one of the French Revolution, where all of the now departments of France are getting new governments, and this is giving a lot of people new opportunities to step into leadership roles, like the Bonapartes. Yeah, yeah it's very much not a wild ambition on the part of them. Now, the Jacobin connection would win the Bonapartes a powerful supporter in the form of Christophe Sawachetti, who is a Jacobin politician and Corsica's representative in the National Convention. Together, Sawachetti and the Bonapartes formed a rival faction to the Paulisti on Corsica. Now, this episode in Napoleon's life can be seen as marking the end of his transition from Corsican to French nationalism, as a boy, Napoleon had longed for Corsican independence, a feeling fueled by his romanticized view of Pauli. While he had increasingly become accustomed to French culture and society throughout his school and military career, 
some of this longing for Corsican independence remained. By now, however, Napoleon and his brothers saw Corsica's future as lying with France, not apart from it. Alas, Napoleon's political and military career in Corsica would not prove to be a fruitful one. On Easter Sunday of 1792, a conflagration in Ajaco resulted in a National Guardsman being shot, prompting Napoleon to open fire on the people of his hometown, which may become a bit of a habit. At least three civilians were killed before the National Guard was forced out of the town by generally pro-Catholic, anti-revolutionary mob. Historically speaking, cops have always acted exactly like cops. <laughs> Napoleon planned a laid siege on his hometown, even cutting off the water supply, but the local regular army garrison refused to cooperate with him. Eventually, Pauli's government was forced to intervene and calm the situation down. The irate Pauli berated Napoleon for losing control of the situation, and the local army commander sent a letter to Paris accusing Napoleon of incompetence and murder. So... Bonaparte quickly departed Corsica for Paris in order to both defend his career and wait for you know, things to cool down a little bit back home. Now, for those of y'all who've been paying attention to the dates, you know what's about to happen. And fortunately for Napoleon, the outbreak of the War of the First Coalition meant that no one in Paris cared about a minor riot in far-flung Corsica. Napoleon kept his commission and was even promoted to the army rank of captain due to the army's desperate need for officers, many of which are fleeing in droves. Napoleon's brief stay in Paris would give him a front row seat to the chaos of the revolution. On June the 20th, Napoleon bore witness to the storming of the Tuileries Palace by the Parisian mob, who seized King Louis XVI and dressed him in a Republican outfit before letting him go. Napoleon saw the fact that the royal guards had refrained from firing on the mob as a sign of weakness, saying that it, quote, set a dangerous precedent and that the king should have ordered his men to open fire. Napoleon's opinion would prove prescient on August the 10th, when the mob again stormed the Tuileries in response to the Brunswick Manifesto, and violently murdered hundreds of royal guards. Napoleon was once again near the scene of the action, and later claimed the sight of mutilated remains of the Tuileries guards affected him the most out of all of the battlefields he had witnessed. In my research on the French Revolution, I, I will say, like, a lot of those guys got hacked apart with, like, butcher knives and pikes and whatever was sitting around like they weren't all shot it was it was pretty bad it was that, very brutal. like napoleon is i i i have no doubt that napoleon is going to in the past when reflecting on his place in the revolution and whatnot lie and and say what he needs to say to be a politically expedient and whatnot but if you're talking about the great acts of horrific butchery you see on uh, August the Tenth, you're not necessarily lying. I don't. Yeah, for sure. I believe him. <laughs> I, I do as well. Yeah, the reason why we mention these incidents is not just because they're interesting stories, but because Napoleon's stay in Paris in the summer of '92 gives us a good bit of insight into his beliefs and ideology. It can be a bit difficult at times to really pin down these beliefs. An uncharitable view would be that Napoleon lacked any firm ideology and instead gravitated towards what was most dominant or useful at any given time. As a young boy in Corsica, he was a Corsican nationalist. In France, he adopted the more moderate beliefs of the Enlightenment. By 92, had he, he'd become a Jacobin. But it's important to remember, he's like 27 at this point, right? Uh, he, he's even younger than that at this point, I think. Yeah, so oh, his... Yeah, yeah he's, he's 23 yet. <laughs> of course his ideology's sliding all yeah. over the place. He's my age! Yeah. He's younger than me right now! <laughs> no, it would be unfair to say that Napoleon did not believe in the ideals of the revolution. He genuinely believed in meritocracy and opposed the institutions of the Ancien Regime as inefficient and superstitious. 
his engagement with the Enlightenment stemmed from genuine intellectual curiosity. Remember, this guy, like, is writing philosophy and whatnot. He believes in things. He's thought about this stuff, even if he's not, like, a dyed-in-the-wool, you know, drank the Kool-Aid dude on it. He's thought a lot about it. What we can say with more certainty is that Napoleon despised weakness and valued strength. His dislike of the Bourbon monarchy ultimately stemmed not from philosophical disapproval of the concept of monarchy, but instead from his correct view that the king and his supporters were fucking stupid-ass bitches, which is not what Jay wrote in the script. In a letter to Joseph, he wrote about the events of August the 10th that, quote, if the king had showed himself on horseback, the head of his troops, he would have gained the victory. And while this is perhaps debatable, I mean, by August, Louis was never getting the uh, mood of the city back. It is true that the king failed to show any degree of personal military leadership throughout the revolution, which we pointed out in our episode on him. Similarly, Bonaparte came to support the Jacobins not because he shared their ideological extremism, but because he viewed people like Robespierre as men of action who got things done. And as we discussed in our podcast, Robespierre did get a lot of things done. Yeah. <laughs> Related to his thoughts on strength and weakness was a strong belief in order and authority and a dislike of the mob. Remember, this guy is a part of the mo bill. Uh, this guy is a part of the nobility. Like he grows up being told that he's better than the rabble, and he probably doesn't know a lot of them, and probably thinks they're kind of scary. Even though he was on the same political side as the Parisians who stormed the Tuileries, he deplored their disorderly conduct. Napoleon viewed such mob action as not desirable, but instead a symptom brought about by weak leadership. The man's ultimate beliefs, influenced by the events of his life and his reading of classical history, was that a nation needed bold, strong leadership in order to prosper, and that weakness would only lead to suffering for its people. One could certainly see how he would come to later insert himself in the position of that strong leader. This 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 guy is Hydric. Like like this guy strikes me as one of the There are a lot of people in history and and the world who think they're hot shit. Who you know this is a gifted kid, right? Yeah. Like who who are told that who who get all the good grades, who read all of the the classics and who see history as a series of protagonists and that they have the right to be the next protagonists. And these are people who uh, respect, like, efficiency and getting stuff done, action for action's sake. And they can very much... will kind of just go to the side of whoever's doing the action. A lot of people like this in history have done a lot of great stuff for great causes, and a lot of them have done a lot of awful stuff for absolutely horrific causes. Uh, that That's definitely the vibes I'm getting off of Napoleon. Yeah, he, right he very much views himself as, you know, the character in his own story, and the main character, and he, you know, that will influence the rest of his life. Then Napoleon's stay in Paris would eventually come to an end, as he would return to Corsica in time to partake in the French invasion of the Sardinian-held island of La Madalena. Bonaparte's National Guardsmen would acquit themselves well during the operation, but ultimately the French were defeated due to either incompetence or an intentional lack of initiative on the part of the Paulisti officers who were in overall command. It's one of the things that like, we, we will never know for sure, but... A lot of people do think that Pauli basically sabotaged the operation. Mm. And yeah, Pauli... I feel like I want to see a dramatic like, HBO story about Pauli and Bonaparte. And... Yeah, it could be neat. Oh, yeah. Now, the National Convention had already come to suspect Pauli of being counter-revolutionary, 
and this defeat would be the final straw in their relationship with the Corsican president. The Bonapartes felt similarly. Napoleon accused Powley of treason in all but name, stating that the operation had been set up to fail, and his brother Lucien went further in denouncing Powley as a traitor in a speech to the Jacobin Club of Toulon, accusing him of secretly collaborating with the British, which was true. While Napoleon would subsequently backtrack, because he probably didn't actually want to see Powley executed, the convention dispatched a fact-finding delegation under the leadership of Sawachetti to the island, complete with their own guillotine. They had, however, underestimated Powley's support amongst the people. The Powellisti rebelled against the French and quickly seized control of the island. Powley declared a personal vendetta against Lucien Bonaparte, meaning that both him and his brothers were liable to be executed at will if they were caught by any of Powley's supporters. In the end, Sawachetti and the Bonapartes would just barely escape the island, while their houses were sacked by the Powellisti mobs. Corsica would soon declare its independence and invite in the British for protection. Napoleon's career may have faded into obscurity after this string of defeats, if it were not for a combination of luck, which is going to play a lot throughout his rise, and political connections. Salaschetti returned to the National Convention, and it was his recommendation that secured Napoleon his position as artillery commander at the Siege of Toulon. Toulon would finally give Napoleon the chance to distinguish himself as a military leader, earning him a string of promotions that resulted in him becoming a brigadier general by the end of his campaign. And I cannot help but bring up that at this point, Napoleon's uh, significant military actions have started with shooting into his own people and then bombing <laughs> French citizen. Yeah. <laughs> what a glorious rise. <laughs> but he's a brigadier general now. And if you've listened to our previous episodes on the French Revolution or are familiar with its general history, you're probably aware the clock is ticking down on the Jacobin regime. Their fall in 94 deprived Napoleon of his political support and brought about a temporary halt to to his meteoric rise. Napoleon was... God damn it, Jay, why did you write in a pe meteoric rise? I hate that term, <laughs> meteoric rise. Wait, wait, why do people say meteoric rise? D them bitches go down! It's a meteor! That's the whole <laughs> point! It's a rock stuck in gravity, a.k.a. the big down, and it's going down! You... You... That's the whole... That's... All the meteor is! It's the single definitional feature! Yeah, the I find the irony appealing. I don't know why this is so important to me. Anyway, what was I talking about? Uh, uh, it was meteoric uh, rise. Uh, all of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, hate it. So yeah, the situation uh, eventually... So, so yeah, he, he gets faffed about to a bunch of unimportant posts in the French interior, and it gets bad enough that Napoleon even puts in a formal request in May of 95 to leave French service and take a commission in the Ottoman army? Yeah, you know... Oh, that would have the, been the timeline. The Ottomans were kind of allies of the French. I mean, they weren't actively partaking in the war, but they had an old alliance with France, and this was a time when officers did you know, do that. They did go from country to country. Um, and like that was that was still a thing that was done. And you'll have you know French officers join the Union Army during the Civil War, for example. Okay, but his request is denied for, by his superiors. And here in '95, we're gonna drop Napoleon off and switch to talking about the new government that's going to take form. Jay, talk to me about part five of the French Revolution, the Directory. Now, since we covered the fall of the Jacobins in our previous episode on the War of the Frost Coalition, we won't go into too much detail about that event here. In short, though, Robespierre's government was deposed on July 27th, 1794, 
or the ninth of Thermidor, year two in the French Revolutionary calendar. The new group of moderate Republicans who seized power in the aftermath of the fall of the Jacobins would become known as the Thermidorians after the month of their coup. For the rest of 1794 and most of 95, the Thermidorians continued to govern France through the National Convention. Now, this is why we call it the Thermidorian Convention after this point. The Thermidorian Convention freed prisoners, arrested and tried many of those responsible for the reign of terror, denationalized the church, and took other actions to promote reconciliation between various elements of French society. Serious consideration was even made to restoring the monarchy under Louis XVI's ten-year-old son, also named Louis, though the plan was abandoned due to the death of the young Louis in June. A Louis's brother, who was next in line, was deemed unacceptable due to having his absolutist beliefs. Going very briefly into that, uh, the death of the boy, um, th that's a real heartbreaker of a story. Little Louis was taken away from his mother when she was fully imprisoned when we got into Reign of Terror style. They tried to get a cobbler to raise him and basically passed him about to a series of people. Like It was the kind of this idea we can like re-educate yeah. this kid, which might have worked if he was like two, but uh, you know, at that point he was six and... I don't know the full story, but the people they put in charge of him were not particularly competent, and he ended up dying a pretty miserable death. Yeah. Basically, just through incompetence and negligence and whatnot. I guess one could say that the uh, French were not as good as re-educating former royals as the Chinese communists. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> In any case, the dream of the Thermidorians was to recapture the more moderate civic spirit of the first phase of the revolution. That being said, they had learned that if they wanted their government to succeed, they would have to be far less naive than the liberals of the early revolution. The Thermidorian convention was almost immediately forced to defend itself, and it did so with zeal. In the so-called Revolt of the First Prairial, Year 3, aka May 20th, 1795, we talked about it in our last episode, the convention successfully resisted the efforts of the Parisian mob. This event marked the end of the mob's dominance over French politics and displayed the fact that the government had now, perhaps for the first time since the start of the revolution, an army that could be relied upon to put down these kinds of uprisings. Now, previously, they're always kind of worried that, like, if we send in the army, they might join the mob. Now it's, I think, yeah. the, the, the And the, and the National Guard, which, which did happen yeah. <laughs> several times. The National Guard often teamed up with the mob to do various actions, which sometimes even benefited the people in power. Yeah, yeah I think by now the army has enough of its own identity that, like, going forward, it'll be a force on its own that can be used against the people. Fighting a war will do that. Yeah. Things have, you know, kind of been formalized and, and whatnot. The Thermidorians also stood by as the royalist Muscadin enacted their vengeance on the Jacobins and the sans-culottes, the poor of Paris. In this way, hundreds of Jacobin members were effectively neutralized without the direct effort of the convention, though I will note that m many people within the convention, some of which even used to be Jacobins, are working with the Muscadin and telling them where various hideouts are and coordinating them, using them as bodyguards, etc. The Thermidorian Convention spent the bulk of the summer of 95 writing a new constitution, which would become known as the Constitution of Year 3. This constitution was an intentionally conservative one, designed to prevent the raucous politics that had happened in Phase 3. The National Convention would now be replaced by a new bicameral legislature, consisting of a lower Council of 500 and the upper Council of Ancients. That just felt appropriate <laughs> to do. The right to vote was limited to property-owning men, and even these men would not actually directly vote for the members of their legislature. 
Elections would instead be indirect. The roughly 5 million eligible voters would now vote for 300,000 electors, and these 300,000 electors would in turn vote for members of the councils. In order to be an elector, one had to own or rent land equivalent in value to around 200 days of labor. In communes with a population of above 6,000 individuals, or 150 in communes of a population below 6,000. A third of the seats of the council would be up for election every year. Now, this, of, of course, completely disenfranchised the Parisian poor and gutted their political power. Probably worth also mentioning that whenever you do complicated, indirect elections and whatnot, it... it it's proven at this point that voter participation just goes completely into the toilet. Yeah, a lot of the people who maybe are able to vote just aren't going to vote because, like, you're voting for the elector. Yeah, like 80% of for people able yeah. to vote won't vote. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the directory elections will have very low turnout. Now, the year three constitution also established a new executive branch of the government, the appropriately named executive directory. The directory was to consist of five men chosen by the Council of Ancients from a list prepared by the Council of 500. One member would be replaced each year. The government established by this constitution would go on to be remembered in history simply as the directory. The Year 3 Constitution was adopted in September of 95. As evidence of their pragmatic approach to maintaining power, the Thermidorian Convention did not simply set aside their seats and allow a new legislature to be elected wholesale. You know, that's how it was done back in 1791. Instead, two-thirds of the new councils would be drawn directly from the members of the convention. Only the remaining one-third would be voted for in the first election to be held in October. This two-thirds rule infuriated the royalists, who had hoped that the upswing in royalist sentiment during the Thermidorian reaction would result in a strong electoral showing for their candidates. The Thermidorians, however, had no intention on seeing an absolutist Bourbon restoration. They had allowed the Muscadine free reign to suppress the far left out of pragmatism, not out of a love for their cause. In early October, the Royalists took to the streets of Paris in an attempt to march on the convention. The Thermidorians had been aware of a Royalist plot for some time now, and the defense of their government had been assigned to Paul Barras, one of the leaders of the Thermidorian faction. Now, Barras had previously participated in the Siege of Toulon, making him an acquaintance of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was impressed by Napoleon's service during that campaign, so he called upon Napoleon to defend the directory from the royalist mob. Nothing bonds to elitists like bombing civilians, I, let me tell you. <laughs> On October the 5th, 1795, French army forces under Barat and Napoleon successfully put down the royalists. Napoleon opened fire on the royalists with a canister shot from his artillery. The so-called 13th Vendemer was no great battle, but would prove important in establishing Napoleon's reputation in the eyes of the Thermidorians. Napoleon would go on to say that the crowd broke at a whiff of grape shot, yeah. which would go on to become a very like famous way to say I used state power to, coer to coerce a mob. And for, for those who don't know what grape shot or canister shot is, Basically, it, you're taking your cannon, instead of putting a solid iron ball in it, you're just putting a bunch of tiny little balls. You're basically using a cannon as it's, a shotgun. It's buckshot. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's buckshot. Yeah, you're shooting a giant shotgun at a crowd of civilians. <laughs> Turns out to be very effective. The 1795 legislative election did ultimately take place in late October, and the Thermidorians won 42% of the seats, with the remaining 58 being split between constitutional and absolute monarchists. Following the formation of the new councils, the first five members of the directory were chosen. The most prominent members of the new body were the aforementioned Paul Barat 
and the former Committee of Public Safety Minister, Lazar Carnot, who generally hated each other. Bra would prove to be the more politically capable of the two, and through his political scheming would win the support of two of the other members of the directory and establish himself as the most powerful man in the government. So remember, the way the directory is supposed to work is like one was elected uh, each year. Yeah. And after five years. But the first five are, of course, elected at the same time. So they're like, one of us of the original five will just go in the first year, and then we'll elect a new guy, and uh, another one will go in the next year. And in order to make it fair, we're going to have who goes first be drawn randomly yeah. by lots, which were totally not rigged, <laughs> which is totally why the least relevant members of the directory got pulled out first. It's, it's definitely not by, by, you know, any sort of shenanigans that Barat remained on the directory for its entire existence. Never drew the uh, never drew the bad lot. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Barat is the most powerful guy in the French government going forward for the next few years. Um, he's effectively in charge. Now, the new directory had three main tasks: prosecuting the ongoing war of the First Coalition, stabilizing the French economy, and ensuring its own survival. Uh, we can also maybe tack on a fourth task, which is enriching itself. Bara was notoriously corrupt, even by the standards of the day. Um, he made a lot of money off of this gig. Yeah, I would argue that the directory was not actually significantly different in sort of its cynicism than uh, over phases of the revolution. But the, gr the rate of graft yeah. did increase. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, Robespierre wasn't, you know, taking bribes, quite famously. Uh, Barat, very much a man open to bribery. <laughs> now, we're not going to talk much about the War of the First Coalition. We already did a whole episode on it. You know, the Directory took charge of the situation during a relatively good time. By 95, both Prussia and Spain had left the war, and actually Spain was switched sides. What is perhaps most important to note is that the Directory rewarded Napoleon's actions during the 13th Vendemer by giving him command of the Army of Italy, where Napoleon's subsequent victories would be responsible for knocking Austria out of the war in 97. Now, Napoleon himself represented France during the negotiations that led to the Treaty of Campo Formio with Austria, and it's really this act, combined with those victories, that made him a hero in the eyes of the French army and the people. You know, Napoleon is sure to keep around journalists with him when he's doing this. And, you know, this is really, you know, Campo Formio is really the thing that, like, that's what gets Frenchmen to, to, to know Napoleon's name. He's the guy who basically dictates peace with, you know, the hated enemy Austria. And we went into this last episode, but... Not only is Napoleon successful, he's successful in what used to be the the backwater shit gig of the war. And so now, first he reforms his army and he, he enriches his men and he makes soldiers love him. And next he uses journalists and whatnot to uh, make the people love him. And you can see how... Like, yes, he's successful, yes, he's good at what he's doing, but he's building a base of power and a mythos around himself. Yeah, like, I've I've seen Napoleon as described as, like, one of the first modern celebrity generals. You know, we'll see this type later on going to, like, kind of like it ends sort of in World War II with people like MacArthur and Montgomery. Great idea to have those. You know, he's very, yeah, he's very good at publicizing himself and making his achievements known to the French people. And this is also an ancient thing. You know, Julius Caesar, you remember as one of Napoleon's idols, wrote a book about his wars in Gaul for distribution to the people of Rome. <laughs> so this is not, you know, something Napoleon's inventing out of nowhere. Now, the economic situation was a bit more shaky for the directory. They had inherited a largely dysfunctional economy. The Jacobins had prioritized the delivery of bread to the people of Paris, which was their power base. 
They had succeeded in that, but it was largely at the expense of the rest of the country. Food insecurity would lead to the unrest of 95, but finally a series of good harvests starting in 96 helped to alleviate the situation. Now, the French printed currency, the Ossignon, had become virtually worthless by the start of the directory. The Ossignon actually has a kind of fascinating story, like it kind of goes up and down, it doesn't linearly go down. It actually goes up because the French sort of accidentally do great monetary policy by uh, forcing uh, people to, to sell stuff and buying up a bunch of currency price controls. Yeah, yeah. But by 95, it's it's like 8, 8%, 5% of face value, and it's just dead in the water. So we print a new paper currency, the Mandates, the Mandant. Uh, which was theoretically backed by the lands seized by the government from the church at the start of the revolution, which you will remember is also what the Asignan was theoretically backed by, and that went really great, right? <laughs> and of course, the value of this new currency yeah. is going to collapse within a year. A degree of stability was eventually reached, not through paper currency, but through the minting of gold and silver coinage, with Napoleon's victories and subsequent extortion schemes in Italy providing the French with substantial amounts of plundered precious metals to turn into coinage. Yeah, it's like, the French extort the shit out of Italy. <laughs> um, they empty out the Vatican treasury and actually take the Pope to France. Like, they are plundering Italy for, for all it's holy worth. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. <laughs> Sorry, Mango just beat Hungrybox 3-0 and I'm, 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 I'm shook. He looked, he is on fire today. The final task for political survival would go on to define the character of the directory. Throughout their time in charge, the Thermidorians had faced threats from both the far left and the far right. This would continue into the directory, with the first notable left-wing challenge coming from the Conspiracy of Equals in 1796. Time to talk about everyone's favorite vanguardist, proto-communist. The Conspiracy of Equals was a left-wing plot hatched by François-Noël Babouf, a previously minor revolutionary who was seen as being a bit too radical even by most Jacobins. Babouf advocated for such things as progressive taxation and aggressive land reform and redistribution. His focus on agrarian policy was inspired in part by reading the about the ancient Gracchi brothers, and Babouf would eventually style himself as Gracchus Babuff, because this period of history is just classics nerds versus classic nerds going at it. Quite notable is that Babuff did not advocate for democracy as part of his conspiracy. Instead, he viewed a short-term dictatorship as being necessary to bring about true equality, with himself naturally serving as dictator. Very interestingly enough, uh, Babuff really could have like was running a newspaper and really could have been that he ran a newspaper called friend of the people in, in 94 95 and when the streets rose in 95 he could have been their leader and maybe have gotten something done because of the fact that they didn't have a solid leader was part of the problem uh, but instead, uh, Babuff's conspiracy took the form of a sophisticated underground plot involving an alliance of cells, mostly led by former Jacobins, united by the desire for insurrection, revolt, and the Constitution of 93. The sophistication of the conspiracy, combined with Babuff's ideology, have led to many viewing him as a proto-socialist. Their plan was to infiltrate military and police units and incite rebellions across the country. In spite of their efforts to ensure secrecy, the conspiracy was too large to remain unnoticed, and by May of 96, the Directory had gained extensive information on its leaders and plans because they had flooded the thing with informants. On May 10th, the crackdowns began, with Lazar Carnot personally issuing over 200 arrest warrants for the members of the conspiracy. The entire movement was neutralized with great rapidity, and its leaders were put on trial. 
Most would be exiled, acquitted, or given light sentences, but Babuf and his associate August Darth were sentenced to death and executed by the guillotine at the end of the month because vanguardism is stupid and does not work. No, the Russian Revolution is not a great example of vanguardism. That's a totally different case. You fucking... That's totally different! Now, with the far left neutralized, it would soon be the time for the directory to again lash out against the right. As in 1795, the motivation for this drama would be the legislative election. The election of 97 saw the monarchists, led by General Pichegru, win 105 out of the 177 available seats in the councils. Pichegru, however, was soon accused of treason by the directors, with evidence of his treason, which was actually very real, being provided by the army. The Directory soon used this as a pretense to nullify the elections of the Royalist candidates in the coup of 18 Fructidor, with the army, including troops sent by Bonaparte, providing the muscle. The coup effectively destroyed the monarchists as a viable political force. Barat also used the opportunity to get rid of his rival Carnot, even though Carnot wasn't actually a Royalist. So we see the Directory leaning on Napoleon for the second time to remain in power. And also, this yes. is called, a lot of people say this is the, the surge towards the right. And it is, but monarchism is, is still not going to fly in France. And if it's not for any ideological reason, it's because, well, that would mean that we're not in power, says the directory. And I'm not an expert in the subject, but I... It makes a lot of sense to me that the army would not be a hotbed of royalism. Uh, for one, that was probably selected out in the early days of the War of the First Coalition as a bunch of aristocratic and uh, monarchist officers uh, fled for Austrian lines. And secondly, you know, a lot of the people in the army started in the National Guard and kind of got revolutionary zeal uh, pumped into them. And even if they're a little cynical at this point, especially if you've fought an entire war, you said, we, we didn't fought and get shot at and whatnot just to go back to having a fucking king. It, it makes a lot of sense to me that the army would not be, uh, w would be against royalism. Yeah. You know, on the part of the directors, a lot of them were regicides. You know, that's to say they voted for Louis' execution. And... Uh, the the uh, the Count of Provence, who was the, you know the new claimant to the throne, made it very clear that he wanted to return to absolutist power and would punish the regicides. So you're not getting a monarchy restoration with, with the directors mm -hmm. in charge because they would very obviously be killed <laughs> if that happened. Um, and yes, the military, I, like I said, it, it had by now formed like its own identity, which had been kind of lacking arguably since, you know, around 89. And that was one very much based in republicanism and meritocracy. Most of the officers are people who, like Napoleon, were either minor nobility or commoners who had made their way up and replaced all those aristocrats who had fled into exile. So yeah, they, they have a strong belief in meritocracy and don't want to see a return to the Ancien Regime. 1798 and 99 would see a return of war to France. War with Britain had never ceased. Indeed, Napoleon had been tasked by the Directory with preparing a force to invade Britain in 1797, though he quickly realized that such a plan was impossible due to the poor state of the French Navy and basically told the Directory it wasn't happening. Napoleon would instead invade Ottoman-controlled Egypt in the summer of 1798, the reasons for this invasion are multiple, and we'll go into more detail on it during our episode on the War of the Second Coalition. But I would like to just say that it is absolute dumb fuckery three stooges shit, both in motivation and in what goes down. Yeah. 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 In short, it fulfilled both Napoleon's personal ambitions, uh, you know, it's not coincidental that two of his heroes, Alexander and Julius Caesar, campaigned in Egypt. Um, 
it fulfilled, you know, the desire on parts of the French government, mainly Talleyrand, who we'll cover in future episodes. This is what happens re- when you let a fucking weeb run your foreign policy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like Talleyrand and his his associates are basically like, we need to reestablish a colonial empire because, you know, they had lost most of theirs to the British. And from the part of the directors, they mostly just saw this as a chance to get rid of the increasingly pompier and politically involved general who was Napoleon. You know, they had largely relied on Napoleon to prop up their government. But Barat and his associates were not so ignorant as to realize that Napoleon could now just as easily turn against them. So, you know, they're basically thinking, uh, send the guy off to Egypt. He can have his little fun war and he won't bother us. Because at this point, Napoleon has an independent base of power enough that he is becoming a major threat to the directors who are like, like who are powerful and connected. But Barat is not like loved. No. Yeah, you know, Napoleon is increasingly popular. He has allies in the councils. Uh, Lucien Bonaparte is in the Council of 500. You know, he's building up his power base in France and within the army. And another factor was, you know, Napoleon might have wanted to calm down some of the accusations that had started to be thrown out against him. You know, even though Napoleon was very popular, there were those in the press who were, you know, accusing him of interfering in politics and actually directly comparing him to Cromwell and Julius Caesar. Now, of course, Napoleon himself was probably flattered by this comparison, but nonetheless, he realized that this was not meant as a compliment. You know, people were taking note of the fact that the army was playing an increasingly large role in politics. Then Napoleon turned the Egyptian campaign into a spectacle, taking along with him journalists and scientists in order to portray it as a kind of armed academic expedition. He would win a series of highly publicized victories over the Ottomans, but was then effectively trapped in the Middle East when the French fleet was destroyed by the British at the Battle of the Nile. Just completely trapped in Egypt. He is just completely <laughs> trapped in Egypt. I know we're going to do like the Egypt... Uh, exposition and I should save all these comments for, for, for that but like it's just such a complete cloud show that I always am shocked that it even happened as a historical event <laughs> yeah and, and this defeat in turn motivated Austria to declare war on France and the second coalition would soon be joined by Russia a power that had sat out the previous war Now, the War of the Second Coalition is going to be the subject of a future episode. What's relevant here is the situation created in France in 99 that in many ways was similar to that of 92 or 93. The Italian republics created by France just a few years prior were quickly overthrown by the Austro-Russian army as it made its way through the peninsula. French armies were defeated along the Rhine, and a British force landed in the Netherlands. We're doing everything again, except now the Ruskies are involved. The heightened sense of emergency led to a strong neo-Jacobin victory in the elections of 1799. You know, throw the old louts out of power, get the new louts into power. This is, you know, classic uh, midterms reversal of fortune politics. And fearing a return of the terror, the anti-Jacobin directors, led by the new member Emmanuel Joseph Sirier, joined Barat in expelling most of the Jacobins on a technicality in what is properly called the coup of 30 Prairial on June the 18th. So now the directory is completely done with pretending that they are a democratically elected uh, body drawn from the legislature. Saeed's desire was not to preserve the directory, but to replace it and the year three constitution with a new one of his own design. In this, he needed an ally. Enter General Napoleon, who had left most of his army in the Middle East to fucking rot like a loser, and returned to France after hearing about France's defeats at the hands of the Russians and the Austrians. 
In actuality, by the time Napoleon arrived, the front lines had been stabilized. Napoleon was nonetheless greeted with jubilation by the people of France, who viewed him as a war hero and savior. You know, when you're the most famous general in the army, anything that the army does, you can get credit for it. Saiz seized on his popularity and proposed that Napoleon join him in a coup against the Directory, a scheme that Napoleon agreed to. Saiz and Napoleon launched their coup on November 9th, 1799, leading it to be remembered in history as the Coup of 18 Brumaire. This coup began with Lucien Bonaparte, he again is a member of the Council 500, convincing the rest of the councils that the Jacobin plot against their lives had been discovered and that they all had to leave Paris for their own safety. The remaining anti-Jacobin members of the Directory, including Barat, were pressured into resigning, while the two pro-Jacobin members were arrested by the army. The councils, which had reconvened in the Chateau de Saint-Cloud outside of Paris, eventually realized that the coup was underway, and angrily shouted at Napoleon when he arrived on the scene. Napoleon and Lucien failed to calm them down, and eventually resorted to telling the grenadiers who were waiting outside that the legislators had made an attempt on Napoleon's life. Hearing of this attack on their beloved general, the grenadiers burst into the chateau and dispersed the legislators. The coup of 18 Brumaire brought about a swift end to the directory. For four years, it had seen off threats from the left and right, increasingly relying on the might of the army to do so. It's fitting, then, that it was eventually surpassed and brought down by the same general who had saved it on at least two occasions. Sayus and Napoleon put together a rump legislative body out of their allies in the Council of Ancients and used it to pass a new constitution, the Constitution of Year 12. The structure of this new government was largely designed by Sayus. Now, Emmanuel Joseph Sayus, who's better known to history as Abbe Sayus due to him being ordained as a priest, was a moderate revolutionary who had kind of been around the revolution since the early days. Um, it was Sayus who had wrote the famous analysis of the Third Estate in a 1789 pamphlet oh, well, saying- Oh, this is Abbe Sayus. Yeah. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I know. I, I actually know who we're talking about. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the guy who wrote, quote, what is the third estate? Everything. What has it been hit hitherto in po the political order? Nothing. What does it desire to be? Something. Yeah, no, Abbe Sayus is... He was a very popular writer and, and, and thinker. Yes. Uh, while yeah. also never stuck it, n n never found himself on the chopping block. Siez was, again, a clergyman, a part of liberal clergy who supported the revolution, but he lost influence in the National Assembly due to his opposition to the nationalization of church lands, and thus spent the subsequent years of the revolution on the sidelines. He was actually offered a spot in the directory in 95, but turned it down. Siez yearned for a temperate bourgeois government, one that would be less prone to political mood swings than the directory, as he put it. In the year 12 constitution, he got his wish, at least seemingly so. Now, the government that was created in this new constitution was complicated, arcane, and very undemocratic. We're not going to go into the, all the details because, spoiler alert, the thing's not going to last very long. But to give you a feel for how it operated, the bills in this new system would be drafted in the quasi-judicial Council of State, modeled after the old royal councils. And then they would be sent to a tricameral legislature, that's three houses. The Senate verified the bills and advised the government on their nature. The Tribunate debated on bills but could not vote on them. And the Legislative Corps could not debate bills but instead voted on them based on the Tribunate's debate records. Only the legislative core and the tribunate were elected by the people, and only those who were members of the list of, quote, notables drafted by the government, which were prominent citizens like, you know, bureaucrats, scientists, doctors, etc., could run for office. 
members of the Senate and Council of State were not elected, but instead picked by the executive branch. And this executive branch would take the form of three consuls that would, in theory, be selected from the legislative corps. The three consuls were picked prior to the formation of the uh, the corps, the first three being Napoleon, Siez, and Roger Ducat, who's an ally of Napoleon. But this would be a provisional consulate with the idea of the members stepping down once the legislative corps took form. Siez and Ducat did step down in December of 1799, but Napoleon remained, taking the title of First Consul and ensuring that the other two consuls would be fairly conservative technocrats who would support him. Sweet Jesus, Jay, this is, this is just poli-sci masturbation. What the fuck is this system of government? It's nightmarish to try to understand. <laughs> like, this is... One of the strangest constitutions I've ever seen. This is the stuff that you included as an example. This, that's not the whole thing. Yeah, like, there are even more arcane rules and, like, what different bodies can and can't do and how they're formed and stuff like that. Like, it's a mess. Now, yeah, the concept of the notables and the council state were holdovers from the Ancien Regime. But the concept of the tribunate and the consulate were instead reflective of the fact that Sayas and Napoleon were both Roman history nerds. The term consulate would thus give its name to this era of French governance, which was to last until Napoleon's crowning as emperor in 1804. That being said, Napoleon's basically in charge. The other two consuls are, are his, you know, his cronies. Like, from 1800 onwards, it's, it's Napoleon. And consul, of course, for those who aren't aware, was kind of the equivalent of the Roman Republic's president, shall we say. Yes. It's, it's from ancient And they ancient had Rome. two of them. Yeah, they, they famously had two consuls at any given time, and which would lead to some pretty, some pretty hilarious military defeats when you had, like, two consuls who hated each other. Well, wasn't the yeah. idea that, like, one consul was supposed to rule at home and the other one would leave the armies? So, yes, so like, they wouldn't the be, idea. like, conflicting? That, that was the, the theoretical way it was supposed yeah, to work. Like, and... They would, like, try to undermine each other, you know, quite often. <laughs> now, the French consulate was highly undemocratic in nature, leading to many historians settling on 1799 as the end of the French Revolution. That it was not opposed by the mobs of France was proof to its members that the revolution was over. The people no longer had the appetite for upheaval, and the army could now be counted on to defend the government. The whole situation is perhaps best summed up by a statement from Napoleon himself, which was given in a speech in 1800. Quote, The revolution is safe on my watch. I am a product of the revolution myself but the chaos and uncertainty of the revolution is going to be over. People should go back to their private interests, their private concerns, and the new government will provide the order and stability and the strength to allow that to happen. Now, Abbe Seas had likely genuinely intended on creating a bourgeoisie government that would prevent extreme politics and rule in a moderate manner. The consulate instead, however, would simply serve as the perfect vehicle for Napoleon's rise to power. Napoleon quickly packed the Senate and Council of State with his supporters and proceeded to largely rule through those bodies. His co-consuls were basically just technocrats who largely left the execution of power to Napoleon. While Napoleon's crowning as emperor brought an end to the positions of consul, the governing framework of this constitution would actually go on to form the basis of the First French Empire. Now, back in 1792, Robespierre had opposed France's decision to declare a war on Austria, which was the act that kicked off the entire, you know, whole Revolutionary War thing, claiming that such a conflict would serve as an avenue by which Caesars, Catalinas, or Cromwells could seize power. Robespierre's prediction would prove prescient. Napoleon was indeed a product of the revolution. Both the reforms and the wars of the revolution paved the way for his ascent to power. For years, the revolution had seen men in rise and fall in the ongoing competition for power. 
At the start of the 19th century, the revolution reached perhaps its most logical conclusion, a dictatorship under its most successful product, Napoleon Bonaparte. I want to end this by taking a review of everything that's happened since. We're supposed to learn from history. We're supposed to learn from the French Revolution. So let's do that. Democracy. We like it. We think it's good. We know it's good. I think it's kind of puzzling if they look back now. We ask, why the French people abandoned democracy? And, you know... You gotta pitch something. You gotta make something good. We think of democracy now as being an inherently good thing. It's, it's like objectively good. Anything that goes toward democracy is good. Anything that goes away from democracy is bad. And to be clear, I agree with that, even to relatively radical ends, I'll add. I, I'm a big fan of democracy. I think that the United States is a very undemocratic uh, country, and I would love to see it democratized fervor. But you can't just assume that people are going to agree with you in politics. You can't just assume that people are going to say de that people are going to love democracy, especially commoners who don't get all of the enlightenment uh, education and aren't up with the current arguments of the times. If democracy wanted to succeed in France, it had to provide and it just fundamentally did not. And there's kind of two cleaves I want to mention. First is the difference between what was laid out in the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen about equality and whatnot, and the first constitution that was created uh, in phase one of the revolution that basically told the people of France that the government would not be very revolutionary. That it wasn't going to change who owed what, who owned what, who was going to toil and who got to live a decent life. And that meant they weren't that invested in it. They were invested in not getting shot. They were invested in their kids' eating so they did what they had to do to make those things happen and you know a lot of this involves the chaos of low grain harvests and the war of the first coalition and that's going to throw anything into upheaval right but yeah. i also see correct me if i'm wrong jay but each successive constitution, well, 93 didn't exactly go, ever really go into effect. Each successive constitution and form of government in France got more complicated, all the way up to, like, the parody of government in the year 12 constitution, yeah. right? Yeah, bo both more complicated and eventually less democratic. You know, the year 12 constitution would also be notable for being the first to not include the Declaration of Rights of, you know, the Rights of Man. And what's, you know, anyone who's had the experience of, Jay, you ever have been invited over to a friend's house and they're like, let's play some board games. And you're like, I love to play a board game. And then they spend like two hours setting up a series of miniatures and trying to explain to you this massive <laughs> rule book. And you, they, they tell you that well, w once you get a handle of it, it's going to be really fun, I swear. But like, it's so complicated and Byzantine and arcane that all of your excitement is just sapped because now it's just work. That's what they yeah. presented the French people with. What? Like, why? Why are the P French people supposed to care about this government? It really hasn't delivered them much. The military is what's delivered them uh, peace and, and security. Remember, the French, the French people in living memory have had to live through two separate paper currencies collapsing on top of price controls and mass executions and tons of shit. Okay, I do not see. Napoleon taking over the system as being really that anti-democratic or bad or worse than what came before. Because fundamentally, the French Revolution often failed to provide for the people. What provided for the people was briefly some uh, price controls and state power backed with a lot of repression and violence. But then just 
the military of France having been reformed by itself and by some smart thinkers uh, and getting its shit together and winning and securing prosperity for the motherland, which is a thing that had happened many, many times in history in the centuries prior. In a lot of ways, the French Revolution is not that different than things that could have happened 100, 200 years before. Yeah, again, you know, that's why Robespierre directly said that, like, we're going to end up with a Caesar or Cromwell. <laughs> so, to me, yeah, to me, like, in order for government to be legitimate, it has to be around for, you know, at least 20 years, right? People have to have to see the participation. They have to see it as a thing if they want to defend it. And because all these governments are so young and because the people are not being allowed to participate in the government because of all of this, you know, arcane who can vote and who can not, they, they have no reason to care. And so these governments are not legitimate. No one gives a shit about them. And so they, they crumple in the wind. My other big analysis is that the French Revolution is really a story of who's got the most friends and who has the most people angry at them. You know, first it's Louis, then it's, say, uh, Lafayette, then it's the Girondins. And you, you have a series of people trying to, to, to balance all of the factions and, 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 and balance everything. First, we had Robespierre cutting off the heads of anyone he saw as a threat. Then the Thermidorians did that. Then the uh, directory does the same in putting down the left, putting down the right very brutally. But what you do when you do this, that we saw this with the directory, and we then before we saw that with, with Maximilian Robespierre, is when you take out enemies instead of build allies, eventually you leave yourself completely outnumbered and with no one to turn to, and no one thinks you're good for them. And so you get kicked over. So, so that that's like my 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 two big uh, takeaways from the French Revolution is the. I guess if I say my three big takeaways from the French Revolution are number one, the 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 people were 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 given no, uh, like, reason to support these increasingly arcane constitutions, and and they they had no. These constitutions were not nearly as legitimate as, say, even our American constitution or the current constitution of France because they weren't in power, they didn't provide anything to the people, and they held no legitimacy. Uh, second off, when you sort of stand for nothing except enriching yourself and staying in power, you you alien and, and you alienate everyone and and whatnot. You know, eventually, you know, why did the mobs of Paris not rise up against Napoleon? Well, they, they fucking couldn't. <laughs> The directory had taken care of that, right? Yeah. And the the third thing, I, I my analysis is, honestly, from my perspective, having gone through all this, what's the most important thing about the French Revolution? Well, it was the reforms to France's military. Like, that yeah. is what has delivered all of these victories, and now this political situation is the reforms France made to its fighting force, which, as we'll see going forward, is going to be very influential. So I, I would say those are those are my takeaways from from the revolution. What do you what what are your anything else I didn't mention? What 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 do you think about the big French Rev? Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think you know the French Revolution very quickly just devolved into a, you know a ruthless competition for power between pretty elite politicians who schemed and plotted against each other, but who eventually didn't really have much support outside of, you know, their own, you know, political circles. You know, Barra's fall from power, we didn't really mention that much because it's not some dramatic thing. It's not like the fall of Robespierre. It's Barra basically just because, like, told by, by Napoleon, like, you know, the gig's over. Like, you know, you're done. And, and he Barat had no power base. He, he has he had yeah, no way he, to, <laughs> to, to yeah, say no. So he just... He's just kind of just quietly accepts that. 
in you know when you have that sort of competition eventually you're just going to get somebody come in who who wins the competition and napoleon does that because he has a power base he has the army and he has increasingly the people and you know a lot of people you know puzzle about how like or joke about how like the french revolution ends up with an emperor being installed but it's not that strange to me again not I, I've mentioned this like three times now, but Robespierre called it, and a lot of other people also called it. Like a lot of people are like, "We're going to end up with a Cromwell if these if these wars keep on going on." And I mean, the Russian Revolution because, ended with Stalin. You know, this is this is a common thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because, like you said, the warfare and the army is hugely important, and it's something which I think a lot of people. Maybe overlook because a lot, you know, if you take like your 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 AP Euro course about the French Revolution, you probably just hear about the politics and maybe a little bit about the warfare. Yeah, like last episode we mentioned that the War of the First Coalition is often completely left out in people's understanding of of this period, but it's it's arguably the most important thing. Yeah, the events of the war determine the events of the revolution. You know, the Brunswick Manifesto the Battle of Volmy, stuff like that, decide in many ways the course of the revolution. And thus it's not surprising that, you know, Napoleon would eventually come out of this system, out of the military, to dominate the political scene. I guess the one other thought I have is how fascinating uh, all of the uh, religious stuff in France is at this time. But we've we've kind of already mentioned all of the the national church nationalization and whatnot. If, it, if, if there's a fourth really fascinating thing about the revolution, I, I would say it, it's, it's that. Um, yeah. An experiment with trying to take state control of how people worship. Yeah. And even, you know, create new religions, which most yes. people don't know where. You know, like one of the things Napoleon will do is kind of bring about an end to that. You know, Napoleon's not very religious himself. I think he really cares that much for Catholicism, but he, you know, he realizes that it'll be more effective to rule with the Catholics, yeah, I- I- instead of against them. I will say about Napoleon that I do agree with him that he is a product of the revolution. And in some ways, the revolution would continue if you ignore, you know, democracy but instead focus on the ideals of meritocracy, of having a civic code of law, Napoleon will spread that across Europe. I'm sure we'll mention that in other later episodes. But like, Yeah, and his government will be a lot more bureaucratic and a lot more efficient than a lot of the revolutionary governments that came before. Yes. He, he, like, like, Napoleon's government will continue to look more and more similar to the what we think of now as like a liberal democratic state. And... To, today, a lot of the institutions of France are built on what Napoleon did. And Napoleon is still a revered person in France as basically their founding father. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Napoleonic Code of Law is the basis of the modern French legal system and the legal systems of countries around the world. Um, so... In a way, you know, the effects of the revolution didn't end just because Napoleon became an emperor. Yeah, and you can easily say that, th- that, that like, again, Napoleon's rule was not less democratic than other phases of the revolution. Yeah. Democracy is what you're trying to measure. Because remember, not a, lo- not a lot of people could vote, and not a lot of people voted. <laughs> yep, for sure. This is this has been a fascinating look. You know, I've I've kind of often rolled my eyes at the French Revolution because it was so complicated. I never really fully understood it, and, or I was um, it, thought it was overrated, and I still think it's overrated. But now I think it's overrated for different reasons because of all the the contradictions, and the contradictions are what make it fascinating to me. The last thing I'll say is I feel like. You know, the American Revolution is is so clean. You can also say this about the American Revolution, but. Uh, it, it's kind of, you know, much, much cleaner and, and in many ways less bloody. Uh, the French Revolution, like, I, one of the things that makes it a revolution is it's done by poli nerds. Robespierre, Napoleon, Abaissette, these, these guys are all people who wrote and they are people who read. And, the, you know, 
there have been people who have remade governments throughout history. But the, these people are, are people who spent a lot of time reading about how government is supposed to work, spent a lot of time thinking about how they would remake a government, and then got to try doing that. And that's kind of a, a new-ish concept in history is like like real poli sci like all right how are we gonna make a constitution how are we gonna yeah. uh bang out how uh power should be divided and whatnot and even though this is no one is competent we're about to end the show and you know we, we talk all the time about how governments are made up of losers and idiots and this shit is hard <laughs> Writing a constitution is hard. Ma making a, a system of government and whatnot that, that the people care about. And, you know, if you put a gun to my head, I could try to do it. And I, I am a narcissist and a and I'm megalomaniacal. So I think I would do a pretty, I'd do a better job than these guys. But it would probably still really suck. You know, is, is, there, there's a reason that most governments fail is, and that constitutional democracy is actually very rare and not done a lot and it's not been around for a long time because it's one of the hardest things for a civilization to do, if not the hardest thing. So, I, and you know, in many ways that makes us cool that we're able, that, that people who pull it off do pull it off. I mean, that's all, that's all I got to say. You? No, I think that about covers it. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you can reach out to us at no one is competent at gmail.com. Follow Jay on Twitter at jharrys48. Follow me on Twitter at Azalea Wyatt. I have been posting a lot of sexy photos of myself lately and hilarious comments. I wonder how many people who listen to this podcast know that I'm like been doing a lot of basement renovation and drywall work recently. I'm oh. really good with with screws. Yeah, you give give it a year or so, and we'll do an episode on your basement once, like your house caves the, in. The the yeah the the, the 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 Azalea <laughs> House Grover ha yeah. the, the the Grover basement. I'm really good at installing insulation. Did you did you knock out any uh, any load bearing? columns or walls uh not yet but i will say uh so when you build a basement uh things change a lot and especially when you uh involves ventilation shafts and uh, piles of furniture you know we have cats the cats they get up things they get on things they get in things and as things continue to get built the cats you know have new terrain to explore Anyway, so the cats have been, like, basically using a ledge uh, made out of some sheets of drywall we had propped against a wall to uh, then, like, sort of grapple climb a wall and get up into a vent. Uh, and have been hanging out there for the past two months. And today, <laughs> by which I mean, like, about two hours after I'm recording this, the strat is me and my dad are going to... Wait for the cats to be really hungry. We're not going to feed them at six. We're going to wait like another hour to be like really pissy. We're going to give them their food, draw them out, and then we're going to stuff insulation up there and, and cut off their, uh, their their route up into that vent before we literally drywall seal them into the building. <laughs> <laughs> Which we yeah. have long thought is a potential thing that could happen. I'm going to do a few line sacrifice to ensure the solidity of the foundation. Not not worth. Hashtag not worth. Anyway, the French series will continue with the rest of the Napoleonic Wars. We'll have plenty of other content sprinkled in throughout that. Hey, wait, I have another reason to, to, to prolong the podcast. Update, guys. The Google Stadia is being discontinued. So, <laughs> totally glad we didn't wait another five months to do that episode. God fucking damn it. I mean, Thing made it longer than everyone expected it to make, frankly. I, yeah. How many years? Uh, three, three and a half-ish. Eh, you know. It's better than Robespierre. Everyone who spent money on the games are, that's, it's totally just going to get deleted. 
<laughs> That's what happens when you don't own shit. It was weird. By the end of doing the research on that, I was actually, like, kind of a Stadia defender compared to a lot of people. Like, it, it worked a lot better in 2022 than it did in 2020, and it worked a lot better than a lot of people said it did. But it's still a technology that didn't really need to exist. And, again, you never owned your, your games, and it was tied to Google and really fucking stupid okay i think the podcast can actually end now can the podcast actually end now jay i want to go watch a melee tournament um, unless you want to unless you want us to reach two hours y'all take care everybody <laughs>